from uh, from Panama. Panama. Uh, the other thing is, I think it's time to have an ordinance for wakes that are caused by vehicles. There's no law, vehicle law, that says you can't make wakes. But we can make an ordinance as a city so that it can be enforced. You have, just 10 seconds, you have people that are getting their garage doors ruined. They're getting water in their houses that wouldn't otherwise get water in their houses because of these big SUVs and trucks and people moving way too fast. I find that totally unacceptable. It's in consideration and consider it for those people to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Travis Palladino, 267 Rex Place. I just want to follow up on what Mr. Preston said. What a great job our sanitation did in this past storm. Our public works, our stormwater people, keeping the stormwaters open. I don't think we've seen flooding like this in the city of Madeira Beach since Elena. So that goes back quite a few years. But everybody did a great job, Mr. Mayor. So the city manager and staff should be very proud of what they've done. And I just want to also, I don't get a chance to come up here to City Hall too often. Also to you, the commission, thank you for your outstanding job in our past budget. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have any electronic comments that don't have to do with the uh, agenda? Okay. Next on the agenda is reporting final official election results, November 3rd, 2020, general municipal election. City Clerk. Yes. As you're aware, we had six charter amendments on the November 3rd, 2020, general municipal election ballot. I'll read each uh, charter amendment and uh, read the final results that were satisfied, uh, that were certified by the Pinellas County Canvassing Board for each of those. Uh, City of Madeira Beach Charter Amendment Number One, qualifying period for candidates seeking the office of mayor or district commissioner. This charter amendment would amend subparagraph A of section 3.3 .3 of the charter to provide that the qualifying period for candidates seeking the office of mayor or district commissioner be the full first full two weeks in December in order to meet the requirements of the Pinellas County Supervisors of Elections should the charter be amended. And for that one, it passed. Yes for approval was 1,972 votes. No for rejection was 540 votes. Charter Amendment 2, District Commissioner resignation. This charter amendment would amend subparagraph B of section 3.3 .3 of the charter to provide that any district commissioner who desires to become a candidate for the office of mayor shall resign his or her office 10 days before the qualifying period begins in order to meet the requirements of the Florida state statute should the charter be amended. Charter Amendment 2 passed by the voters. Yes for approval was 1,921 votes. No for rejection was 566 votes. Charter Amendment 3, manner of holding elections. This amendment amend section 3.4e of the charter to provide that any candidate receiving the highest number of votes in an election for office shall be elected to office and if two or more candidates receive an equal and highest number of votes for the same office then those persons shall draw lots to determine who shall be elected in order to meet the requirements of the Florida state statute should the charter be amended. Charter Amendment 3 passed. Yes for approval was 1,624 votes. No for rejection was 862 votes. <laughs> Char 
Charter Amendment 4, Terms of Office for District Commissioners and Mayor, this Charter Amendment would amend subparagraph B of Section 2.2 of the Charter to change the term of office for district commissioners from two to three years and change the term of office for mayor from three to four years to avoid the cost of annual elections should the Charter be amended. Check, um, charter Amendment 4 did not pass. Yes for approval was 1,131 votes. No for rejection was 1,382 votes. Charter Amendment 5, Terms of Office for District Commissioners and Mayor. This Charter Amendment would amend subparagraph A of Section 3.4 of the Charter to change the term of office for district commissioners from two to three years and change the term of office for mayor from three to two to four years to avoid the cost of annual elections should the charter be amended. Charter Amendment 5 did not pass. Yes for approval was 1,095 votes. No for rejection was 1,411 votes. Charter Amendment number 6, deletion of independent audit provisions inconsistent with state law. This Charter Amendment would amend Section 4.10 of Charter to provide that provisions of Section 4.10 that are inconsistent with state law shall be deleted should the Charter be amended. Uh, charter Amendment 6 did pass. Yes for approval was 1,846 votes. No for rejection was 610 votes. We appreciate everybody that came out to vote, and and so and we have a March election coming up on March the 9th, 2021. Yeah, I'd like to say those uh, the number of people we had come out to vote was awesome. I've never seen it that high before, and congratulations to all the residents of Madeira mm -hmm. Beach for going out and. Uh, doing their civic duty. Thank you. Next is a presentation, introduction of new hire and lieutenant promotion. Uh, Chief Bell, will you take the podium, please? Good evening, Mayor, Commission. Thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time this evening. Um, to say 2020 has been a challenging year is an understatement, but to have individuals that want to either begin their career or take on even more responsibility during this 2020 year goes to show you the character of your fire department. So with that, I would like to first introduce firefighter paramedic Luis Suarez came to us August 2020. <laughs> Next is Fire Inspector Raul Perez. He comes to us from Polk County. He has 22 years of dedicated service throughout the state of Florida and California, actually. And he was promoted in August of 2020. Next is the promotion to lieutenant. Lieutenant is a coveted position. It's as high as you can go on the street. We had three individuals test for that position. They included a written exam, uh, tactical scenarios, a board interview with myself, the city manager and human resources, or, or Karen actually. Um, to show the level of preparation for these three individuals, one point separated first from third. One point, tenths of point. So, that just goes to show you their preparation for this and how serious this position is and how serious they took this. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Paramedic Lieutenant Tom McClave. Thank you. 
There was supposed to be one more this evening, but unfortunately, Joanna Marinello got a call at 5.15, and it ended up being a pop sprinkler head, so she's stuck on scene and is not going to be able to be here. I hope you guys would, or you, you, the commission would give us another couple minutes into the December meeting to recognize her as well. Absolutely. Thank you. To the gentleman that just don't join the Madeira Beach Fire Department, you've probably joined the best fire department in the county. So I just want y'all to know that this is a family, and uh, y'all take good care of us. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think we've got a gentleman out there that would like to make a comment. Uh, Travis, you want to come on up, partner? And actually, guys, the mayor's right. Uh, I had the privilege of being the mayor of the city of Madeira Beach. I served five years on the Pinellas County EMS board. Two of those years, I was actually the president or sitting chair. Guys, I'm going to tell you what. I remember this young police, and I put his badge on him one night. And you know what? Now he's the fire chief. Now he's the fire chief of Madeira Beach. So, Clint, you're like the son I never wanted but I'm so proud of you. Congratulations, Clint. And, and Mr. Mayor, once again, you're absolutely right, because guys, Little Station 25 here in the Madeira Beach, it's called your turnout time. It's the amount of time that it takes you when that bell rings to get into that fire truck and roll out the door. Madeira Beach is number one in Pinellas County. It has been for years. That means they're on scene fast. So, Chief, to all your new guys, you know what, I miss y'all. Uh, congratulations. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next is topics for discussion tonight. Um, first on the menu is backyard chickens. <laughs> Come on up, Jerry. We're going to roast you. Okay. You're full of them, aren't you? Okay. My name is. I've got a list. <laughs> my name is Jerry Davis. I live at 749 Sunset Cove, Madeira Beach. Um, Mayor Hendricks, Commission, thank you all very much for giving us time to come here tonight and talk about all the topics that are important to all of us. Um, I know you've seen me here before, and so I'm just back to reiterate, you know, some of the things that I said the first time about um, proposing an ordinance to have backyard hens be acceptable within the city of Madera Beach. Um, like I said before, I'm a business owner here in town, and so I hear a lot of people, and people have even come to me and said, hey, you know, this is something that I want to have, and... I know that there's people around that have them, but we're not sure if we're allowed to have them or whatever. And so um, part of the reason why I came the first time was because during um, the pandemic, um, I thought, wow, what a cool thing, you know, for families if they were allowed to have backyard hens for kids that are home and people that are homeschooling, just to have that, you know, sense of family interaction and a source of education for how to care for an animal and also, you know, to learn where some of their food comes from. But with that, I also want to make sure that people are understanding that I consider all of the um, the other side of having, you know, hens. They're really cool to have, and they're great, you know, to have in your backyard and watch them peck around and interact with one another. But I also want to make sure that people understand that I don't want it to be something where we could have roosters because that is not something that I feel would be acceptable within our city limits. Definitely would not want it to be something where somebody could have a business that profited off of the hens or, you know, egg production. And I would definitely want there to be some sort of um, parameters within the ordinance that if there um, was a situation with somebody's hen that they made sure to, um, you know, take care of them in a very humane way. Um, I did have a hen that passed away at one point in time, and I'm the crazy person that takes them to the vet and has them cremated. So I personally believe in making sure that if you are, a, you know, an owner of any sort of animal, that you're responsible for all the facets of taking care of that animal and making sure that they do have a safe environment within your home or your backyard, a coop-type structure, 
and um, and to make sure that you're also, you know, that the that that coop is following, you know, the other ordinances that we have within our city as far as you know having sheds or out structures in your backyard or whatever that those would you know fall under those same ordinances as well. So, thank you very much for all of your time. I'm here for the hymn. Thank you. I, uh, you know, there, a couple of things. One, at first I said, really? But then I started thinking about when I was a kid, and we had rabbits and ducks and armadillos and raccoons and possums and, and uh, snakes. We had 27 snakes, I'm sorry, 17 snakes in the house at one time in cages. So, you know, in this day of Nintendo and games and kids sitting in their room playing on all that stuff, uh, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's time to let families do something like this. Uh, there's a lot of other things we need to look at, though, and that's... This is a structure in a backyard, so it's got to follow codes as far as being secured. You know, just the other day we had the storm come through, so it's got to follow the same guidelines everything else does as far as the structure goes. And, and um, you know, I worry about them at night. There's coyotes around that are also feeding on the raccoons and possums and cats that may be out at night and, and that's just another dinner menu for the coyotes um, so that's I'd like to get some input from you other guys on this I'd like to see a limitation on the number of hens I'd like to see a coop required so that they're not just free ranging out in the backyard um, I think I'd like to have something in our ordinance about the smell or odor. I could just see somebody not taking care of something and then they happen to live next door to me. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would like to be able to say, hey, they, they need to come clean this thing out and, and, and do it, right? Or make some sort of a fine if they don't. Um, but I am concerned about the coyotes. Are we just going to be attracting them now, you know, with this? Or? Well, they're already here, you know. And, and, of course, the raccoons and armadillo, or raccoons and possums are nocturnal, and that's when the coyotes are around. So, I, yeah. you know, I think they're probably feeding on that. But, Jerry, I'd like to ask you a couple of other questions. You know, you, uh, you talked about the numbers of them you said you need an odd number yes because um they they in order for them to interact in a healthy manner you don't want to have even numbers because you don't want two to gang up on two so i suggested no more than five um especially if you have a family and you're using you know their eggs for your meals um because they're generally going to lay you know one egg each day some of them will be in a laying season and some of them won't be and then at some point in time, they will no longer be layers. And so you won't always have the same consistent egg production out of five, you know, hens for the life of the hen. And so um, I feel like five is a really good number because you're maybe not going to eat eggs every single day, but they stay fresh for several days, even outside of the refrigerator because they're not pasteurized like the white ones you see in the grocery store. So, and I firmly believe the same way that you do as far as a coop and it being safe and it having a roof over it and a door that locks in a way that, you know, predators cannot have entry, either ground predators or, you know, other bird predators. Because, um, I mean, we all know about the circle of life and survival of the fittest and all those kinds of things. So if you're going to have it back there, it's just like having a cat or a dog or anything else. It's your responsibility to make sure that your yard and your home and their home is safe in a good environment and that they're, you know, safe from prey. So do you let them out occasionally? Yes. Yes, they Tell have an area that. in the yard where they can range and walk around, and they have a coop that, I mean, 
the hens are probably more well behaved than most people's dogs <laughs> because they have um, really a uh, strong sense of instinct. In the morning, they know it's time to get up and have breakfast and get out of their either roosting station or their nesting box and peck around and graze and everything. And then as the sun starts to go down and it's dusk, they know that it's time to get in a place of shelter. And they will go to their coop and they will get in their respective places where they like to roost or in their nesting boxes if they're in a nesting phase. And you just have to go over and close the door because they're already in there. So they do that all on their own? They do it completely on their own. And that's something that you train them whenever you very first get them to show them where their home is and to show them where their safe space is. And especially if they're an egg-laying you know, hen, to show them that they do have a nesting box that's safe because they are very protective of their eggs too. And they want to make sure that they're up and off the ground and safe from um, predators. And so it's important that you provide all of those you know, things for them. It's just like a cat or a dog. If, you, if they're out during the day or if you want them to have a dog door where they can come in and out and use the restroom, you provide it for them. Cat, you need to provide a box, a place for them to scratch. You know, all of, all of those same things. If you're going to have you know, hens, then you need to do the same thing for them that you would any other animal. They deserve to have a, a, a clean, safe place to, to reside. So I think of other towns I've seen this in, but they have roosters and they're all over the place. And you walk down the sidewalk and you're... Yeah, I think that, um, that I don't... I, I wouldn't think that the city of Madera Beach needs roosters. I, yeah. Um, I, they I, are... They tend to be aggressive in, in some breeds and um, they can get quite large, and um, they're loud. And so, um, and hens aren't. <laughs> they're really quiet, and they just kind of do their own thing, and you might hear a little peep out of them every now and again, but that's generally when they're laying an egg, and it's actually kind of a cute little sound, so not anything like a rooster. So this should be backyard hens, not backyard chickens, right? Absolutely. And not for dinner, only their eggs. About that. <laughs> Definitely not a, a source of food other than the gifts they give you each morning. So, right now we have an ordinance that specifically says no chickens in Madeira Beach. Yes, we do. Anybody remember why? I don't know because I don't know when that. Yeah. That I know we went through this with goats a number of years ago, but. Uh, oh, wow. It's not unusual. Um, most cities don't allow chickens, or they didn't for a long time, possibly because of the rooster issues, um, and also because in bigger places um, they become uh, prey to dogs and cats. It's hard to control. But um, there were also some lawsuits back in the 80s with cities trying to control for it and people putting too many chickens in, and you know there's, there are issues with runoff. Um, if the areas aren't well maintained, as there would be with dogs and cats or anything else. Um, so just generally over the years, cities had, had adopted ordinances that um, disallowed farm animals and fowl. Um, and there was also concern about uh, just the bacteria effect on other animals with fowl. This, ducks are even worse, but that there's a lot of bacteria in their feces. so. It can affect even dogs and cats, but it's a matter of just keeping up after the yards, like any other pet you would want to keep up after. Yeah, and some people would and some people wouldn't. And, that, you know, I don't know what we do with the seagulls, but... but um. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we have a lot of wildlife around here that we definitely can't but, yeah. about their hygiene, but we definitely would need to worry about the hygiene of the animals that are on our personal property. Period. Well, and also, no matter what kind of you know, there would have to be permitting. I mean, For sure. each one, they would have to be banded so we know who's, you know, if a chicken gets out, it's just like a tag on a dog or a cat. Um, you know... I don't know, guys, is this something we want to think about trying on a trial basis, six months or a year, and let it sunset if we renew it? Or how do you guys feel about it? Well, I think we need an ordinance 
I, I read the first time this came up, it came with kind of a bigger packet, and it had the ordinances from other. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh -huh. I think we need to look at those, and yeah, and make I, a very restrictive. If yeah. you do this, well, I yeah. Mean, I would love fresh eggs. <laughs> My compost pile would love the chicken uh, dropping. Me, girl. <laughs> but, uh, well, that's yeah, and and. Jerry, your last packet you gave us had that in it, but yes. it also had many pages with like letters right down the center, so you couldn't really read what was on the page. At least on I think that was just like advertisement at the bottom on that page. Okay, but, and that's and this has some more in there too. There's um, like Florida chicken laws in certain you know different counties and, and cities, and then there's also some from California, kind of you know touching on those same things of coop size, you know, making sure that there's permitting, you know, maybe even offering some sort of class, you know, to where people are educated. I know that probably um, Debbie would think that's pretty cool. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that definitely an ordinance needs to be in place, that there needs to be, you know, rules and regulations, that you need to have, you know, some way that the town understands that you are somebody that has hens in your yard, that whether you register or ban them or whatever, and that it's, you know, that it's something that people take seriously. It's um, it's something I did definitely growing up in Texas, you know, and so having them is something that was inherent, you know, to me and myself, and then it just became part of our family. And I know there's lots of other, I, we aren't the only family. There's tons of families that would absolutely love to be able to have a few hens in their yard and have fresh eggs and just have that interaction. And so if you need more information brought back up, like I did the first time, I didn't know if I should bring the same information twice, or if I should bring, you know, additional information. So that's why I didn't bring the same packet. Well, I think first we need to decide whether or not this is something we want to do as a commission and then go from there on what the restrictions should be. Because, I, you know, permitting-wise, this is something, you know, this is taking uh, manpower, person power, for inspections and, and being sure they're taken care of correctly and... They're, that they're not getting out and that FEMA guidelines are being followed and, Understood. and, and yeah. you know. And code enforcement is another, yeah. I mean, you got to right. consider, that guy's right. got, like, we have enough to do, really, don't we? With the and if they don't have a ban, they're coming to the house and, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, they got to be banded. Well, I'm willing to give it a, a shot. We, don't, we only have three of us here, so I don't know if you want to... No, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to see the, the ordinance, and I'd like to see, you know, um, how we plan on enforcing it. I mean, I think that's kind of the big deal here, um, putting it on paper and making it work. I haven't heard, you know, I've heard some objection to it, but for the most part, everybody's been pretty positive about it, and until we hear more people speaking up against it, I mean, I'd be, I'd be willing to look at a pretty tight ordinance in order to just take a look at it and see if we can push it forward. Yeah, I think it would have to be a pretty tight ordinance, but, you know, at the same time, I, you know, I, like I say, I think back to when I was a kid and all the stuff we had, and that, that's just what we did, and, you know, and that's probably what a lot of us in this room did when we were kids, were have animals or, you know, going to, you know, get up in the morning, your mom didn't see you until the street light came on out there. For sure. Uh, we didn't have any armadillos in the cul-de-sacs of New Jersey, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have you probably seen, lived on a block. I have seen New Jersey rodents, though, so. <laughs> so. Well, we're talking about 40-foot wide lots now, too, which is another thing. I mean, that's, that's pretty close together. I mean, I know people leave their dogs out in the backyard and they let their cats out and stuff, but I don't know. Chickens are perpetually outside in the backyard. Well, apparently not at night. Oh, no. Uh, no. They, no. Just like any other bird, they roost, you know, so as the sun goes down, they're in the hutch. Um, sure. But... And just um, FYI, I've not had any predators at my house or anywhere around. Or any, seen, any or what? seen on our street. Any what, son? Predators. Oh. 
that you know of. I, yeah, not anything or, or seen on our street or spotted or anything. No. Well, it's, I live a couple streets from you, and I've seen them. So. No, I'm just <laughs> even even Don't the, send them our way. because even the <laughs> raccoons will be in those hutches. Yeah. They're not secured. So if this is something we want to start nailing down a little bit more, I'm I'm for it. Maybe you can get us that those ordinances that you have and oh, yeah, for sure. get us each a copy, and we can. Sometime when we're at home, each of us go through it and pick out points we like and and uh, go from there, and, and uh, maybe we'll do it on a trial basis. We'll try it for a year, and if, if we got a boatload of complaints and people aren't handling them like they should, then we'll just let it sunset. Okay, well, I'll get that info to you. What do you, what do you guys think? Is that acceptable to sure. you? Sure. You think that's okay? All right, great. Thank you all again very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Public comment. Tom Edwards, protected address. Just as a thought, if, if you go forward with this, you're going to have to, I would think, have a permit issued for the people to have them. And the permit would be, let's say they started having complaints on this particular person and the person doesn't allow code enforcement to come into the backyard because it's fenced and everything like that, they would lose their permit and then you're probably going to have to get some type of order to go ahead and have them remove it. So you got to have a stick and a carrot there. Right. Yes. I agree, Tom. Yep. yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Here comes trouble. <laughs> it's trouble. Roger Gersten, 171 East Madeira Avenue, Madeira Beach. Um, yeah, I was asked to come up and kind of support the, the chicken initiative here, and I guess there's worse things that we've talked about in this uh, office. But um, like you, I grew up in a, a town that, uh, you know, we were an agricultural town, and as kids we, we raised chickens. I mean, that was, you know, it was never an issue. It was part of, you know, learning the circle of life, like Jerry said. Um, she asked me actually to do the chicken dance while I was up here, but I'm not. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, don't, I don't see there being a problem. Maybe limit, I don't know if you can limit the number of permits that you hand out. Uh, is that something so you don't have, you know, a thousand residents having, having their own chicken coop going or, um, you know, uh, maybe in that, that might be an option as well too. So, um, but uh, I, you know, we, we've got, you know, every kind of bird and, and uh, wildlife that's nesting in our, you know, and pooping everywhere and making a mess. I don't, I don't see a chicken making a, making a bit of big, big problem here. So anyhow, and plus we have the chicken church. So what else, right? <laughs> Can't go any worse than that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Yes, sir, Bob. Bob Preston, 425 South Bay Shore. I would really like to see the commission give them a chance to uh, have these hens in the back of their yard. Um, I grew up on a ranch. It was a chicken ranch. We had 200,000, a little more than just a few. Uh, they were fryers, but I pulled a bunch of hens out of there, and that's how I sold eggs to the other farmers around, uh, the other people around to buy hay for my horse. So uh, there's nothing better than a fresh egg that stands up in your skillet. The eggs you get in the store now are just absolutely horrible. And uh, when you grow up with animals, you learn to respect life and things that go along with it. And uh, if a parent has some children and they want to teach them uh, different things about life and the evolution of life, that, that starting with chickens in the backyard is not a bad deal. And uh, I agree with the other comments, it needs to be a permit and all that stuff. And but I was thinking a little bit of this. Um, you have to, 
it has to be areas that the chicken waste can be held within grass or something because you sure as heck wouldn't want it just to be on some type of pavement or pavers or anything like that. So there's there's things that you need to kind of take a look at when you look at your ordinance uh, so that you don't uh, cause undue runoff into other people's yards or whatever. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Travis Palatino, 267 Rex Place. Besides being a homeowner here, I also own a business called the Alligator Attraction. I do hold a USDA license. Also, I hold a Class 1, 2, 3 FWC license. We do know chickens are fantastic pets. We know they're very intelligent. They can be loving. They'll hug on you. If a lot of y'all are old-time residents here, you probably remember going to Web City and playing tic-tac-toe with the chickens <laughs> in Web City. Or am I showing off my age here? <laughs> also, um, just... This has come up before. So last time it came up, Mayor Schantz, Pat Schantz. And Pat, you're going to start making me uh, quote Mirdira Beach history. I love it. It came up and it failed. There is an ordinance in place, and I'm sure you all have already seen it, is with farmyard animals. Chickens are on it, hogs, cows, and I think there's a few other. So number one, you'd just be amending an ordinance that's already in place. Number two, we do have a building department. So far as transparency and accountability, you're going to have to put a permit in to build this structure. So there's people know where it's at. We have nuisance ordinance that were put in place back in, I believe, 2013, 14. And I believe uh, uh, Attorney Trask was uh, part of that. So you would just maybe have to add a little bit of nuisance ordinances. Things were in place in the nuisance ordinance, one, two, three strikes, you're out. So I don't think it's hard. They're great animals. Um, of course, y'all know me, I've got pigs and I think pigs are the world, and some people don't quite understand that one. But uh, it is a good idea to consider this, but we don't want to see what happened in 2011. Somebody had a great idea. They wanted to turn Madeira Beach into Key West. They released about 15 roosters in John's Pass. And let me tell you, I can tell you how much it cost the city to go catch them. It was quite expensive. So it's a great idea. Chickens, Jerry, I love them. They'll snuggle with you, like I said. I think Bob said education with animals. We're all about that. So I, I think the commission should definitely consider going forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else? Next is the agreement for finance and HR services. Um, you know, there are only three of us here tonight. Uh, I don't know but what we need to have more here to have further discussion. I will say that um, after rethinking where we are right now on HR, I, personally I don't think we're getting a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, we've got someone that's here for one day a week for $54,000 a year and uh, our HR director who was going to go to finance is still doing most of the HR work. So I don't know this, that this is something that we want to go through with as far as getting, uh, uh, doing this contract. I would rather see us look at, um, hiring a part-time HR person, uh, even if, if they come in four hours a day. Uh, there are plenty of very qualified, retired folks out there that would love a part-time job to be able to come in and, and do that HR position. And uh, we could still see, save money and rather than having someone here one day a week, have somebody here five days a week for four hours a day. That's just my feeling on it. I just don't think we're getting the value for for the city. Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, um, obviously, I have no issue with the finance contract. I think we've already 
voted on that, and I don't, I'm not really sure why they're tied together, but that's secondary at this point. Um, but I don't know about the rest of you guys, but this isn't how I kind of envisioned it working, and, and, and I'm spot on with you here. We're getting one day a week from somebody for $54,000 a year. Um, my calculations, that's roughly $130 an hour, and they have no supervisory role. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure exactly. If Karen's still doing benefits and payroll, I'm not really sure exactly what they're doing here. Are we paying them $130 an hour to make sure our executives follow the rules? And if that's the case, I'm going to go through the roof. I mean, that's that's crazy. So um, a couple of suggestions. I like your suggestion about a part-time person, uh, and especially if Karen's going to continue to handle benefits and payroll, we could either get a part-time person or we could recruit somebody from within, send them to classes, get their qualifications, and on completion, we can give them a $10 an hour raise, right? And, you know, that'll save us tens of thousands of dollars a year on it. And I know it sounds like a huge stretch, but it's really not. Just a few short years ago, I mean, we all had multiple titles. I mean, at the time, I was the director of Parks, Rec, Special Events. Marsicano was handling Central Services, which oversaw public works, the marine and sanitation. Vince Tenalia was the city treasurer, finance, and HR. In a small city, that stuff's really common, and I think we'd be wasting a lot of money because we got a lot of you know inexperienced people doing jobs that experienced people doubled up on in the past. So we got to simplify this and save some money. I think this is, I couldn't agree with you more. It, it, this particular number blows me away. I don't even know how, we got, how this even came about. I don't think that's what we spoke about that day, but I could be wrong. I, I just, I know the contract's not ratified, so we can chat about it you know, tonight, but wow, I'm completely against it. Yep. Well, my thought was the contract just has to be a little more specific. It's, um, it doesn't even require any days on site if you read the contract. Um, but I'll tell you, HR directors make $200,000 a year. I mean, they're not, this is a, a really important position. Even a generalist makes $85,000 a year. All right? So just, these aren't, uh, these are, a difficult job and a, a good HR person is worth their weight in gold. In my, but like when I was looking at this contract, I didn't see anything about doing investigations or harassment training, which is pretty much mandatory. I don't see any auditing of HR files, no, nothing like that that I envisioned our HR person doing. So maybe the, the, and Andrew, I'm sure you'll speak to this, maybe we just need to be more specific on what we need. I do believe we need someone here more than one day a week. And even if it's three days a week, three mornings a week or something, um, well, we need someone accessible for our employees. Yeah. And, and if the HR person that we had that was supposed to go to finance is still doing a lot of the work, then <laughs> I don't well, see I don't know what I don't a lot of the work it's... is. I don't know. Just processing payroll and benefits, in my view, is not HR work. HR work is being available and receiving complaints or um, calming two people down that aren't getting along, making sure everybody's working well together and getting rid of people who are not working well together. You know, those that are troublemakers, they, they got to be on site and be able to see this going on. you got to be in the office doing that, I think. And you've got to be a confidant of not only the employees, but also of management so that you can advise management on what they think is we need to do. And then recruiting is part of it. I don't think Karen's do. I mean, maybe she is. I don't know. But I don't think processing benefits and processing payroll is really necessarily HR duties. I think that's a separate, a separate thing. Yeah. But I do want to see someone who is certified by the Society of Human Resource Management, I mean, with the actual certification to be, a, you know, an, an HR generalist at least. I mean, I'd love to have a director in here running their, that part of the show, but like I said, they, they make a lot of money because yeah. most companies or most entities know that it's a very important position. 
And if we want to keep our employees happy, which is what we want to do, and keep them here, you know, and not get in trouble with the, you know, the laws, you know, we definitely need someone who is going to audit our HR files and do the harassment training and be there to do investigations and to tamp down, you know, arguments between employees or disagreements or if someone wants to whistleblow, they need to go to somebody. You know, we need to designate that person's a very trusted person and needs to uh, kind of needs to be here more. I believe. I think that's well, what we all envisioned. Yeah. Well, that's and I think there are professionals out there that are retired that would enjoy four hours a day. I mean, I would think if, as long as they're here every day, a twenty-hour week, they could. They're retired because they don't want to go into the office. Five days a week. Well, you'd be, you would be surprised after after being retired for a while. The wife or the husband may say, "Why don't you get out of here, take up golf or something?" Oh, okay. I don't know, but um, and Andrew. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so happy to address <clears throat> a lot of the questions and concerns raised. Number one, to the the finance and HR services in one contract, both are provided through my firm. Um, both finance and, and HR. Um, the HR director that we have is Michelle Matthews. I brought her here, so she's here this evening so she can speak to some of the specific duties and obligations that she has. Currently, her workload is physically on-site at one day a week, plus off-site duties as well. So she is still active uh, when she is out of the office. Um, I've, I've spoken to Michelle. If, if collectively we feel that more time is necessary, Michelle can devote another day on-site as well to provide two days on-site plus off-site work as needed as well. She can work that within her existing schedule. If you all feel that more time is necessary, maybe three days a week, we can look to supplement with another resource. Or if you feel that, you, that the perfect retiree that is out there at, at a very low cost to come in five days a week at four hours a, a day, we can either try to help you find that resource or the city can, can venture and, and look for that themselves. No problem. I'm here to just to, to, to serve the city and, and provide what I feel is, is the best option possible. As far as Michelle's qualifications, again, I brought her here. She's highly qualified. I can ease, definitely have her come up and speak to not only her own qualifications, but some of the work that she has been doing with the city thus far, the investigations, the recruiting, the onboarding, offboarding, all those things. At the end of the day, I, you know, I want what's in the city's best interest. And if we feel we're, if you all feel that you're not getting enough service for what you're paying, you want to increase the service, let's talk about it. If you feel that you do want a full-time person in this, in this role, I can tell you for someone of those qualifications on the salary level, it's probably around 90 to $120,000 and you add benefits, you're looking at 140, 150. If you feel that that is what the city needs and you need a full-time highly qualified HR director and you want to spend that money, so be it, no problem. Uh, if, if, if you want to still explore the outsourced option, working with Michelle, I'm happy to explore other arrangements, increasing her time, increasing her workload, no problem at all. Um, again, Michelle can speak to the things that she does and she can also speak to the, the workload split um, for the, the, the things that she does. Yes, uh, Commissioner Price, you're correct. Payroll and benefits were remaining with Karen uh, as, she, as she migrated to finance, but that function is, is, is held by finance, not HR. So those, those duties are held by Karen. Karen is assisting um, Michelle in, in, in her capacity as HR director and is, and is assisting to a degree. And if we want to increase uh, Michelle's time and, and decrease Karen's assistance in that arena, yes, we can, we can have Michelle here more often. So I'm happy to explore any option to, that, that satisfies you. And at the end of the day, you feel that it's best to go in a different direction on HR. No problem at all. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, we'll be happy to try to make whatever smooth transition that you all feel is in the best interest of the city. And if you want, we can have uh, Michelle come up if you like more details on on, yeah, on things. Tell she's us doing. what what she's been doing. <laughs> sure. I know there's a lot of things to do when you're not sitting in an office here, and and HR people get calls, you know, pretty much 24 hours. <laughs> I think it's maybe not from a Deer Beach, but maybe. <laughs> Good evening. 
Mayor and Commissioner. Um, my name is Michelle Matthews. I am a certified human resources and OSHA instructor. I've been doing HR and safety work for over 20 years. I have both the SHRM that you were referring to, Society for Human Resources Management CP certification, and also the HRCI PHR certification, which is Professional and Human Resources. I've had both of those for many years. I have been helping out in this role for a little over a month now. When I first joined, the main concerns Karen had was to transfer a lot of items over to me, such as the recruiting, such as the dealing with employee conversations, employee investigations. I've already uh, sat on, on several of those meetings to try to facilitate the best measures for us to make for the employee. That's going to be both for the employee and the employer. Um, I have not had to do any formal investigations yet in my time here. Um, I am answering emails, doing uh, recruiting in the evenings, on the weekends when I'm not here on site. Um, I have already been doing job postings, researching. Um, we had a situation where someone was classified as non-exempt, which means they would get any overtime that they worked, they would get paid time and a half. And someone had suggested that they become exempt. And based on the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have to meet certain criteria. So I did the investigation with her. I talked with other people. I got down to the details, and she was not qualified to move. If you had moved her to a salaried exempt position and the Department of Labor did an audit, you all would receive a huge fine. I also have already caught an OSHA violation from one of your contractors and brought that up because that would have been a willful violation. So I am putting some items in place when I am here. I am happy to move over to two days a week. I am my own HR and safety consultant. I own my own firm. I am a subcontract through Andrew's firm. So I can make that an arrangement for you. I live in Odessa, Florida. For me to come for four hours a day, I wouldn't be able to service my other clients. And quite frankly, uh, for the little bit of funds that I am receiving, um, which is not the number that you all threw out this evening, uh, I'll just be 100% transparent about that, it's not worth it for me to be able to do that. I'd be happy to help you find someone who is. But as you mentioned earlier, Commissioner, excuse me, Commissioner Price, um, it is more than just the $54,000 that you all have budgeted for this. Mm -hmm. um, before I opened my own firm, someone in my capacity who did everything and did not do the payroll unless there was an audit or handling workers' comp, um, filling up 13 uh, weeks wage statements, things like that, that we were over $150,000 a year before benefits. Sure. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I hope you understand when we look at it and we see what the city's being charged and we see you coming in for one day a week. To me, it doesn't look like we're, we're getting a good value for our dollar. Now, you may be spending a lot of time off-premises doing things that we don't see. Um, but that's that's... That's the outward appearance, anyhow, as far as as what I see. You know, I see fifty-four thousand dollars for one day a week, and maybe it's a lot more hours than that that you're actually putting in. And and I understand that you're not getting fifty fifty-four thousand a year. There's, um, you know, some other some other companies that are apparently getting some of some of that $54,000. So those are those are questions we have and and if you look at it from a from a city standpoint where we're trying to watch a a tight budget this year and those are things we've got to look at. Yes sir, I understand that. In fact, one of the questions started coming to me from different members um, including the city clerk and some other people when I was in person in the office. Um, I didn't understand why the questions were coming up about my hours, and then when the budget was brought forth, plus the conversation you and I had in the brief introduction when I was here, and then also Commissioner Price, uh, the brief introduction, the questions about hours, I started to do some research on my own because that's what I do. I look into things, and um, that's when I had found what 
your budget is and what you are paying and what I am receiving based on the hours. I'm already giving a, a reduced rate for the city because that's something I do with for city government and nonprofits. So that's why then I had brought it to Bob, um, excuse me, the city manager's attention and said this might be why some of the questions are coming up. And I'm very transparent. I showed him my contract that I have um, with the client that I'm working with who is then working with Andrew's client. Um, and that's where it came up that I can do another day if need be, but I want to be 100% transparent about that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I think we're looking for someone more than two days a week. Well, yeah, I mean, it looks, and, and looks kind of, and Michelle, this is not about you. It's not, no. it has nothing to do, this is all a financial decision. But let's put it all in perspective. I do understand that, that good HR people make good money, but let's, talk about the size of our firm here. I mean, we only have, what, 80 employees or so, right? Our chief executive officer makes $125,000 a year, so we can't have the HR person making, you know, time oh, no. and a half on the, on, the, on the city manager, right? I agree. So we got to keep it in perspective, and you got to look back. Four years ago, we didn't even need this. I mean, that's how crazy this is becoming. I get where your head's oh, at. No. we got to keep ourselves on, on the straight and narrow because we've gotten lucky that we... We're not sitting in court every day right now. Um, but I think there's a way to do this without, I'm not even saying we don't do this for six months or for this year just to get us through this, but you know, getting somebody internal that can do two jobs is not a horrible idea. We can get them certified. We can pay for their classes. In the long run, it'll save us a gazillion dollars. It really will. And we'll have somebody homegrown that knows our city, knows the, you know, the ins and outs and the local, the local flavor of it. But I just wanted to put it back in perspective. We're not a company that's going to pay anybody $200,000 at this particular stage sure. or, or ever for that matter. I don't see that, you know, unless we start raising parking rates to $10 an hour or something. Um, but let's, you know, let's, let's kind of, I think this is something we can beat around, you know, a couple more times, but I, I, you know, and Michelle, certainly not against you. I can't, I can't approve this number for one day a week or even two days a week. If we're going to do this, we got to do it the right way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is, and this isn't, you know, any of any of your doing, or we're not trying to lay blame or anything, Michelle. We're just trying to watch our budget here. Okay. I understand, sir. And I know you're good at what you do. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Well, do we want to try to find, some, you know, put an ad out there for a part-time HR person and see if we can, or do we want to try and choose somebody, have Bob, you know, give us his expertise and if there's somebody we want to train from within it takes a while to get sherm certified i mean yeah i don't think we need to decide tonight really i mean to y'all yeah but i mean we didn't have anybody certified for <laughs> yeah forever <laughs> no, for 50 but we years had, right so we um, had a city manager that was you know he was such a rock star he got the union decertified i mean they had he had the knowledge yeah. right so um, we do, I don't know if we have that knowledge with our city manager today that he could take over that type of a role like uh, like a previous one did. I, yeah, well, it's, you know, I think back to um, Fire Chief Bill Mallory that ended up wearing five different hats and then was accused of not doing any job well. So I don't want to get into a situation where we're Stacking hat upon hat upon hat on one person. Um, right, but we also don't want to overload middle management. I think that's something that we might be guilty of at the moment. We don't have enough people with shovels in their hand. We have too many people with you know pens in their hands, and I think that that's something we really have to address at some point. So yeah, and I and I that's why I say I I don't know I don't know that we need a full time person. No, I don't think we do yeah. either. And I mean, the kind of the rule of thumb is one HR person for every hundred employees. Yeah. 
So, and, and I only brought up what HR directors make because that's what they make. <laughs> so it's well, not they that may, I was inferring yeah, that we should in pay Maybe in private that. industry, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. You know, okay. But, um, well, here's a suggestion. Maybe we just put, um, we can do just a regular ad with this number, and we could also promote it internally. Let's see what we come up with candidate-wise, and we'll go from there. But first things first, we also have to, I mean, I, I know our civil service board is meeting to go over the charter with, with um, Mr. Trask's um, colleague, uh, but we've got to tighten up our, our manual because uh, it, it leaves HR on an island where it's, you know, they answer to the same people that they're investigating. So we can't, right. we, gotta, we gotta really change that up in order to do this correctly. So, so maybe this break isn't such a bad thing, so. so just so I have clarity, would, would you like to, Michelle to continue in her current capacity until a replacement is found and we have a more uh, a viable long-term solution? I think so. I think so. Okay, and then to the extent yeah. she can come in two days a week, that would really be great. And then, do you want you want some on-site presence closer to five days a week at four hours a day, and, and you might find that resource, or do you want to me to explore a potential three-day-a-week option, or do you want to just post a post a position and see what? I think what you we'll can get? post have Bob Daniel take care of that. Post Sounds good. Okay. Be honest, yeah. Yeah. Because I think if we do bring on someone like that, we're going to make them an employee of the city, right? Yeah, and but not, it, also though, if they're, you know, if we can, if we can find somebody that's been in the industry and knows what they're doing, and they want a part-time job, if you're 20 hours a week, you're not getting all the benefits um, that a normal city employee would be getting. They've probably already got their insurance and whatnot, anyhow. Um, it's just my thought, and I, you know, maybe you feel like. Maybe four hours a day is not enough. I don't know. No, I think, that, if, I think that's but enough. But if one day a week is enough, then certainly four hours a day is enough. Yeah. I just would like someone available, I mean, for the employees to go to uh, for any kind of a grievance or any kind of, a, I mean, this is the person who's going to smooth things out before anything escalates. Yeah. So that's the only reason I'd like them to be accessible. Yeah. And then... You know, once everyone knows when they work, then, then they'll know. Hey, I gotta talk to HR, I'd better get to City Hall before noon or before one or whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're gonna leave it to Bob <laughs> to investigate and yeah, put an yeah. ad in or yeah. whatever. Okay. Okay. Would you all like to approve the, the standalone agreement for finance services? Because I did include that as a, and, and bifurcated it Okay. Um, I was wondering why that was there, yeah. Finance and HR, in case we couldn't come to accord on the finance and HR. It's just a, it's just a workshop. Yeah, we, yeah, we, can't, but we can't approve anything. Tonight. That's true. So I, we can just bring that to the next, discuss it, next regular meeting. No. Is this the same agreement that we had with you when we hired you initially? Correct. Okay. okay. No change. It's a modified agreement. There was some additional language that was added to it, but it needs to be renewed. And that's why right. it's coming back. Okay, and, and the modified language is what? Um, we added some language relative to insurance and um, public records, and, and we can provide you with the uh, bullet point as to the things that were added to it, but we did add, tweak it just a little bit. Okay. Okay? Yeah, I think we'd probably like to see that. Okay. Where it was, yeah. Where it was. But my, my general thought is yep. we would approve it. No, no change to the fee structure. Right. <laughs> Important stuff. I know it sounds like that's everything, but really it's not everything. <laughs> okay. Is there any public comment on this? Bob? Bob Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive. I bet you were glad I was on vacation. <laughs> um, the HR person is really, really important. Um, I think the city has got away by the skin of their teeth in the past. And 
you want an HR person that is the mediator, that the confident to the employee, the confident to the uh, administration. Um, it's super, super important. I would imagine Ms. Mr. Trask can tell you many occasions how HR screwed up and cost cities hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. So, um, you know, maybe it's uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or maybe it's just a Tuesday, Thursday thing. A um, little part that I caught about uh, Michelle's contract, it sounds like there's some people in between that should be knocked out of the equation so that she gets the cash and maybe it makes a better deal for her and a better deal for the city if she's doing a good job. You know, uh, the OSHA thing that she has her qualifications in is really a, a good thing too because that's very important. OSHA can really come down on the city pretty hard as well. So I'm just saying that uh, be careful what you ask for. Uh, and if you don't get the right people in there, uh, you may be saving a few dollars here, but costing you hundreds of thousands later for uh, having somebody that's not qualified to do the job. So just think closely about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Is there any electronic comments on this? No, not on this item. Okay. Next on the agenda is ICMA requirement for city manager, uh, Vice Mayor Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Start Mayor. This discussion. Um, you know, I don't know how much we really need to discuss on this. Um, just to give you a little background, because I've been reading through a lot of this, uh, doing some research on the ICMA stuff, and um, you know, I'll keep some of my comments to myself on my feelings of the organization. But uh, I think how this all came about, you know, this was thrown on a ballot by what was a partisan group of, of residents that was stacking charter amendments. I mean, if you remember, we had two elections in a row where there were 10 amendments and then 10 amendments. And, and and I think, you know, on paper, this looks like a great idea, right? I mean, let's require our city manager to be in this super ethical group and we can also use that group to vet future candidates. Well, we're kind of learning that's not really the case, right? Um, we have this requirement that makes us, you know, it limits our pool of people that we can choose from dramatically. And then, you know, we take and we realize that some of these censures, when we look to try to find out about a candidate, some are private and some are public. And, you know, I've, I've pulled some stuff off their website, and I can't even tell you what determines whether something's public or private. You know, you know put conduct, conduct that resulted in public censure, and they're on the same tenants. And then conduct that resulted in the private are on the same tenets as the one before, there's really no rhyme or reason to this whole thing. So um, my personal opinion is I would, you know, and we're also, I'm just sorry, I left out one thing that I had in my notes. It, it costs taxpayer money to, we pay for Bob's registration every year, or and it's in every city manager's contract that we pay for their annual fees for this. Um, to me, it, it's it's a joke. I mean, we, and not this board specifically, but collectively a board, we haven't really had our be <laughs> the best picker when it comes to our, our, our city managers recently. Um, but this referendum makes it much harder to do what we're hired to do, and that's make decisions that are in the best interest of the city. Again, it completely limits our pool of candidates. Uh, my suggestion tonight is that we give the residents the complete story and not a partisan version. Uh, and let them make a decision that will not only save us money, but allow us to pick the best person for the position going forward, not the best person that belongs to this social club. Those are my thoughts. Well, we certainly know we don't get much information out of them when it comes to vetting people and finding out, you know, 
things that happened while they were an actual city manager to our city, uh, they won't disclose it. But so it pains me to pay them 1000 2000 I don't know what we're paying them. But it's significant from what I understand. Well, even if it's 50 cents, if our attorney can't get answers out of them after four letters, I, I really don't know what use they are for us to use them as a measuring stick for any of our future city managers. It just doesn't, to me, it's a kind of a hollow requirement. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think if we throw it on, you know, like, like I said, we've got a few months before the election, we can throw it on the ballot and we can educate, you know, and, you know this one kind of slipped through. Because like I said, on paper, you put this in a referendum, it looks great. I mean, hey, you know, we want to make sure that this guy's in the top, or this guy or gal's on the top, you know, and belong into this great organization. And you know, I don't know. I, it just doesn't seem like we're getting our bang for our buck, if that's what we're talking about again. So, Well, from what I understand, uh, you eliminate about 40% of the candidates right off the bat um, by having that requirement in there. So we're losing some good candidates for that. And uh, it's no secret. I knew, you know, many of us knew what was going on there. It was no big secret. So um, it was it was something that, you know, is a scar on this city. And I, I uh, it's too bad, really. But, but at any rate, um, I'm for putting that back on on a vote for a charter amendment to to rescind that that um, amendment that was put in. And the only other point I'll add, I believe that, um, and this could be old information, but I believe only thirty to forty percent, only thirty percent of cities actually require an ICMA registration for their city manager. I was going to say, how would we find that out? Yeah. Is that something, Madam Clerk, you could... Is that a lot of them recommend it. A lot of them in the, in the job description will recommend it. But I think as far as a, an actual requirement, it's like 25 to 30%. Because they want to keep their options open. I mean, it's right. great if you can yeah. find somebody that has these credentials. Terrific. But why would you limit yourself? You t you're taking out a whole pool of candidates that don't belong to it. And then you got to then to get them into the organization, if you find somebody you like, then you got to register them with this and register them for what? We can't find out anything about them, so I don't know. Let's just save some money. I just, well, well let's let the people decide, but I mean, I just, you know, like I said, I, I, I don't think we're getting anything out of this organization, so. No, I don't think we are either. Not not from the information we tried to get from them and, and they wouldn't give us anything. So, uh, City Clerk, what kind of notice do you need to start formulating something for the next election? Well, of course it would require a ordin an ordinance uh, put together by the city attorney to uh, for that charter amendment, and which would require two hearings, you know, the first reading and public hearing and the second one. And uh, Attorney Trask, the the ordinance that we have that prescribes the manner of holding the election. Uh, you know, I was planning on bringing first reading in December. I guess we would delay that to add that, or can that come? Could that charter amendment be in a? Does it have to be in the the ordinance that we just put together? Or I'm not following you. You know the uh, the one we're following in the charter that we have to prescribe the manner of holding the election and letting everybody know what the polling places are. Right. I guess we can. We have until February to actually to adopt that. I guess we can do first reading in January and do the second reading in public hearing in February. We could do that later, but the problem is, is that. The ballot, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the ballot language cutoff is December 30th. It is. No, well, we have our qualifying, yes, December the 30th. Our qualifying period, of course, the 18th of December would be for the uh, the commission candidates, the last day at that day. Um, I can speak to, I can talk to the supervisors of elections about 
given us to the 30th to add the um, charter amendment to the ballot. Yeah, my understanding it was the 30th. Yes. It came up in a different city, but uh, and that's only what I'm doing off the top of my head. So to answer your question, Mayor, we need we need an ordinance that had to have two hearings on the ordinance. It would have to all occur before December 30th. We'd also need a ballot language resolution that could be adopted on the second reading of the ordinance. We'd do the ordinance first on the night, and then we could follow it right after that with the resolution on the ballot title. Um, and then once we have all those three things done, then that can go on the, um, the ballot in March. So we're going to have to rush it if that's what you want us to do. What do you do? You feel like we have time to get it done? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I do too. Okay, because you know, frankly, job qualifications should be decided for these charter positions by the city commission that is seated. They should not be in a charter amendment. The commission should decide what qualifications they want for their city manager, their city clerk, their city attorney, and their uh, city treasurer. Um, should, it shouldn't be decided by charter. That's just my well, feeling. So. I think we need to couch it in terms of based on the IMCA's inability to give us any benefits whatsoever for their for being a member Right? If anything, they hindered us from finding out some information. I mean, do we really want to spend the X amount of thousand dollars every year to to require that re, uh, require our city managers? Just, I mean, say it like it is. Yeah, I I say let's let's uh, go ahead and push forward with it. Okay, thank you. We'll we'll get working on that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any public comment on this? Tom Edwards, protected address. So you've couched certain assertions in your discussions. If you're going to do this, you need to have a public forum, bring everything out in the open, yeah. discuss it, yeah. let people ask questions because there's apparently a lot of stuff going on that I'm not aware of, and you should bring that up. And the ICMA is just like other professions. You got doctors and lawyers. You ever try and get information from those organizations on how their employees? They're on the website. If a lawyer has ever been disciplined and for what? Yeah, it's so, so hard ICMA to get. ICMA does not do that. <laughs> so, and I'm sorry to talk. To you know, it's it's just something that that other professional organizations are storm, stonewalling too with their members too. So that's not just this group. The election for this particular section was November 6, 2018, and of course it was passed 1,298 to 897. The people voted for it were 59% of the residents wanted it. So if there's other issues coming up, please bring it forward. I mean, you're trying to rush this thing through, but I don't hear anything, well, let's go ahead and have a couple meetings, let's get it out to the public, but they're informed before we go ahead and try and push this through. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Bob Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive, Madeira Beach. This jerks my chain. It brings up old wounds. Um, the charter amendments that were voted upon by giving misinformation in that election, in the election before that, was just horrible. As far as the ICMA, it is a good old boys club. I called them, yes, and only 40% of the city managers, when I talked to the lady there, because I was our City managers are part of the, uh, in the ICMA. When Evans was sitting right there, I asked him, what, what does it take to become an ICA, an ICMA member? 
you get recommended by two other people that are in the ICMA. There is no qualifications. It's a good old boys club. And that's why you don't get any information out of it. Because it is a good old boys club. And it's a party when they have their yearly thing. So, yeah, this brings up, you need to go f for it. You need to explain why to the city employees or to the city proper, why this is not good for the city, what the ICMA actually does for the city, which is absolutely nothing for the city. Unfortunately, this was driven by a vendetta on one person that used to work here. And that's the only reason. So, yes, it needs to go on the ballot. You need to explain to the city proper what's going on, why it's there. I wholeheartedly support it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Mayor, I would like to recommend when you go forward with this that Maybe um, Mr. Trask uh, can come back with very specific language and explain what the differences are in membership and registration or certification, because there, there's a difference between being a member of ICMA and being certified as ICMA. Certification requires a training program and the recommendation of other members who are certified. Membership requires paying your dues. There's there's not a lot of I've belonged to ICMA since grad school, so, and but have never been through their training program because I did other training. So there is a difference there, and, and when you go through the ballot change, you may want to be really specific about why well, you're wanting to make the change and what that difference is. Okay, thank you. I think I think our uh, I think the charter did not specify certification. It simply said being Membership. a member of ICMA. Yeah. The um, thing is that we only have a finite, we only have a small paragraph that we can publish. Most people don't come to these meetings or watch these meetings. So they don't know the rationale of getting rid of that requirement. Yeah. Well, and again, the, you know, it is our job as a commission to decide what qualifications we want for any charter officer. So, hey, hey, Linda, real quick, hey, since you're a member, do you know why um, some censures are public and some are private? No, I haven't ever had a problem or a complaint um, to deal with, and so I really didn't pay that much attention to that. Okay. Um, I, it's probably similar to the, the um, personnel issues and, you know, what's considered private. And also it may have different rules applied to those who are certified as opposed to those who are just members. They don't really have a whole lot of information on just members. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was just curious if you knew. Thanks. Is there any uh, electronic comments? Yes, there's two. The first one is William Gay, 423 150th Avenue. Item 6C, ICMA requires requirements for the city manager. Commissioner Andrews, please explain why you put the ICMA membership requirement on the agenda. Any discussion of the topic should include the publication by the city of the ICMA's findings and expulsion of the former city manager, Shane Crawford, from the ICMA for violating its code of ethics. In addition, the city should publish the findings of the Florida Commission of Ethics investigation of Crawford. Crawford accepted reduced rent at, luxury, at a luxury condo in Indian Shores owned by a developer who had real estate projects pending approval in the city. Crawford, per the city development code, was responsible for processing and vetting these applications. The developers were David Bacher, Golf Grill Restaurant Project, and William E. and William F. Carnes. 
Madeira Beach Town Center. Crawford was abolished and fined by the Ethics Commission for his actions. The second one is Robert Luddick, 13231 Gulf Lane. November 19, 2020, BOC Workshop, Item 60, Council Strong Mayor, Form of Government. As a current well, property... We're not there yet. That's the next item. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Oh. Okay. Yep. yep. Well, that comment basically shows you how partisan this was. I mean, the... Yeah, that's just not even... Happening. We, we, had, we had two other city managers right after him that one got fined by the state, or actually... Uh, found guilty by the state for uh, stealing from the city and, and, and abusing his power. And the next one turned himself into the ICMA, but you can see the comment didn't even refer to that. So you can see how pointed this, this, this amendment was when it first went out, so. Yeah, and the, yes. and the first one you mentioned, rather than being terminated from the city, I think he was given two weeks off. So um, moving on. Item D, uh, Council Strong Mayor, Form of Government. Vice Mayor Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm not gonna take long on this. I, I kinda just wanted to bring this up for, for conversation. We'd have plenty of time to, to beat this around a little bit. But I mean, the main reason I brought it up was similar to what we were talking about earlier. Um, collectively as a board, we haven't, done a very good job of picking the chief executive of the city. Uh, we were just talking about it. One of them, the you know, first one was publicly censored and expelled by the ICMA. Next one found guilty by the state of Florida for abusing his power and stealing from the city. And the next one reported himself to the ICMA for violations. Um, bottom line, maybe our citizens can do a better job picking, uh, picking one on their own. I personally think that having a resident in charge, somebody who has their skin in the game, may be the answer. We don't have to negotiate a contract. We can just set the price with the benefit package and, and and let people run for it. And I'm pretty sure the candidate pool, especially without the ICMA requirement, would be much better than what we've had to choose from recently. Uh, you know, and the other thing is, and, and I want to pat my current mayor on the back, um, while this doesn't concern him about this going forward, I witnessed the amount of work our current mayor is doing, and, and therein lies the problem. Our mayor can attend all these meetings, spent countless hours researching issues, and, but at the end of the day, the only juice he has over the rest of this board is he has the ability to call a special meeting, and he's the first one they ask to throw out the first pitch at Little League opening day. So, I mean, but you know, it, but the amount of time, and, and like I said, I tip my hat to you, John, because I, I, I think you're doing an amazing job, um, but you know, I, I don't think you were planning to work as hard as you work, and, and uh, me as a resident, I appreciate that. So I'd just like to put that out there for discussion amongst the board. Like I said, nothing has to happen today, but I, I'd obviously like to get you know, input from you guys as well as the citizens, and of course, any input Mr. Trask would like to add. Well, I thought about this, <clears throat> and obviously if, if we did go this route, we'd have to pay our mayor quite a bit of money and it would be a full-time job. And uh, Well, it would eliminate the city manager then, so we really wouldn't lose any money. Okay. You know, it'd be just a kind of a, actually we'd save the mayor's salary. But we are, in the future, I can't imagine us getting the quality of mayor that we have today, right? I mean, we've, we've had some duds. Do we really want to I think you'd find with a full-time position, I think you'd find that the level of candidates that come out of the woodwork would be pretty substantial. I mean, that would be my personal guess. I think that if you, you know, uh, we just do this for fun, obviously, because it's not you know, right. that $563.43 a month. Is, it's a lot, but, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I just do it for, for kicks. But um, I do think that if you, like I said, I, I don't even know. I mean, I think that, that we have a lot of executives out there 
that might be looking for a change in profession that could come in here and run an entire organization. They may have HR background as well. They may have a strong finance background. They may be able to, you know, help Andrew with the budget and be able to produce the thing and we could approve it in two readings and get it all over with instead of going line by line with it. Um, you know, I think that that's that's where we're kind of at right now. We got to find leadership, and we got to be able to have somebody that can, you know, basically command command the staff. And I think, you know, by doing that, if you find the right person to do that, you can cut a lot of positions. And you can, you know, I think we're really, really, and we saw that when we did when they did that salary survey. The one thing that stood out to me more than anything else, we had so much managerial up here and <laughs> I mean it too was, many chief mom up in the right <laughs> I mean you know we got too many people running around with you know ballpoint pens and not enough shovels you know and and uh, that changed from before we you know remember the when we had uh, directors meetings and staff meetings you know five or six people in it that was it now they got 15 people running through the door right so it's there's a lot of different there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but we're, I think, again, going back to what we talked about earlier about let's put things in perspective, you know, we're a city of 4,300 people. We're two miles long, right? We should be able to coordinate all these things with, you know, not that many people sitting at the top, but the other people working below them. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. I've seen it happen, so I know it's possible. I just... You know, I just wanted to throw this around a little bit. There were some really interesting, I don't know who put this together as far as putting the, did you do this? You did a wonderful job because a lot of this stuff is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's, re it's, really, it's really interesting reading to see how other, other cities do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd, like I said, I'd like to kick the can a little bit and see if anybody's interested in, in chatting about it. No rush, though. Well, with our term limits, even if we found a really good mayor, city manager, um, the person could only serve the city for six years, right? Correct. Right, as um, of right now, sure. Yeah. I mean, but if we found a really good city manager, they can make a career out of improving this city. I mean, that's just another. I mean, it could involve a lot of changes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I've, you know, I agree with you, Commissioner Price. I'd, I'm sure there's a lot of very talented people in Madeira Beach, but I also know that in city government there are a lot of other intangibles that a city manager, a good city manager, brings with him on on the laws, on the way you can do things, and and zoning and planning and all the other variables there there are that I don't think somebody that comes in just from the private sector and I don't think we have I mean I see other towns on here that are small also but I don't know that we have a large enough nucleus of people to draw from that could kind of hit the floor running here and and do us do the city a proper job so uh, to me I think we need to we need to find you know we need to have a good city manager but I, I don't think a resident running for office is the route to go that's just my feelings on it But we can have we can have some more discussion on it. Like I said, um, Commissioner Andrews, there's there's no rush on it. We can we can keep on talking about it and and maybe get some public comment on it. Well, there's some of these cities on here, Indian Shores and Reddington Beach, that are half our size, and they managed to find someone that. Well, there I know on Reddington there's no term limits, and he's been doing that for many, many, many years. So there's, you know, it mm -hmm. was a lo it was a long-term OJT. Mm. So you good? I'm good. Okay. Okay.
we, we, we can discuss it some more. Public comment? Tom Edwards, protected address. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that uh, I think the, the pool of people within the small city like this isn't like St. Petersburg that has, I mean, St. Petersburg has like 271,000 and they have that strong mayor of former government, as does Tampa with 413,000 people. The, the other thing that they have that these two cities that you pointed out with Reddington Beach and Indian Shores is they're keeping the legislation branch separate from the executive branch. The mayor is not part of the council. In these other two smaller cities, they are, but they, they realize that you've got to go ahead and have that separation of power that checks and balances, and that's, that's important. They also have term limits. They can't serve more than two terms. And I think the public wants term limits, you know, for, for the state legislature, for the county, for the different municipalities, that's why they put term limits in. That's overwhelming, the public wants that. So, and then, you know, you have a question about an item coming up and you go to the city manager and you talk to him and he can research it and talk to you about it. I'm not quite sure if the mayor is part of the city council, could a commissioner go talk to the mayor about a particular issue without a sunshine violation? So those are things that you got to think about. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons. I've done some reading on this while I saw this topic coming up, but the one thing I did see is that the city manager of former government has proven that it's the most popular choice of structures among U.S. communities with populations of 2,500 or greater. So I, I think we should keep the form of government that we have if, and then try and get the best candidate in for that position. Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Bob Preston, 425 South Bayshore Drive, Madeira Beach. Uh, I think it's an interesting proposition and it's worth looking into. But I think the other side of the coin is, is that the people that serve on this dais, like yourself, Mayor, you put in a lot of time. And I truly believe that the people that put in their time belong to the boards, go to these things, are well worth, is well time spent. What I see is that you're not compensated enough for the hours that you put in. I truly believe that. And I think the compensation for the commissioners and the mayor should be increased. I know you've already done this budget thing and what have you, but I don't, if you're doing a good job and you're working for the city and you go to all these meetings and stuff, you are not getting compensated for the work that you're doing. Plus the meetings, I mean, one meeting a week, two meetings a week. It's just absolutely crazy. And, you know, you're not here to make money off the city, but you should truly be given the opportunity so it doesn't cost you a damn dime to serve the city. And that's not happening in many cases. And I think that's absolutely wrong. So I think you need to look at, as a city, I don't know if that's an ordinance or whatever the case may be or how that compensation comes up. I haven't looked into that. But I think that your stipend every month needs to be raised without a doubt. And if people see that this person's getting X amount of dollars a month, and they're a commissioner or they're a mayor and they're not doing the job, that's sure a uh, topic for discussion during election, you know? And uh, I think people will 
realize that, hey, we're just paying this person to do this, and they're not doing their job. And I think we need to look at that heavily. Thank you. Thank you. It's a labor of love, for sure. Is there any other public comment? Any electronic comments? Yes, there's two. William Gay, 423 150th Avenue. Council strong mayor form of government. Is Commissioner Andrew advocating for the city, advocating that the city drop the current city manager from form of government and adopt a council strong mayor for government? Um, Ronald Luggett, 13231 Golf Lane. As a current property owner and past resident of Madeira Beach since 1981, I'm opposed to changing our city manager form of government to a strong mayor form of government. A city manager is a professional who is hired based on his proven managerial skills and accomplishments. They have a wide base of knowledge in areas of administration, code enforcement, public works, human resource, and policy. A city manager who is a member of the ICMA follows their guidelines in the performance of their job. This is a full-time career and serves at the pleasure of the commission which can remove them for poor performance or their duties as opposed to having to wait three to four years for an election. A mayor is elected solely based on political popularity every three to four years without demonstrating if they have the managerial skills for the position. It is a matter of popular versus comp competency. City commissioners do not have the authority to remove the mayor because he or she is doing a poor job of running the city, but will only have the authority to remove that person if they have convicted a crime, which means that their removal or replacement is based on a popular vote every three to four years. This is too long of a period to wait for removing a person not capable of managing the city. Therefore, I am in favor of the present form of government Madeira Beach presently has a city manager form of government. Thank you. Next is Recreation Department bus driver position. Mr. Hatch, no, I'm already too busy. <laughs> well, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. I uh, apologize if I doze off. Working with the newborn at home, so just poke me if it happens. Um, bringing this forward, uh, I, I've been with the city now for six years, and uh, we've, we've had more bus drivers than city managers at this point. Uh, it is a part-time position that is not very coveted. Um, I myself have a bus license, and one of my other staff members who was filling in for me while I'm uh, at home these days uh, has a bus license. But outside of that, our most recent bus driver just put in his, his notice uh, due to health reasons. So we are at a point where um, we have the position open for applications, and we are receiving the applications, but we are looking to be a little more creative and maybe kind of fill a void that we created during the budget process. Um, as you all can see in the memo, we did remove the funding from two full-time positions uh, during the last budget. And uh, had I known the bus driver was going to quit, I wouldn't have done that. But um, so I, I'm kind of coming here with the idea of merging the bus driver position and also filling some other potential maintenance, uh, after-hour events, uh, aftercare, facility maintenance, all that stuff, all those needs together. Um, we have, uh, I put together a little spreadsheet Per the budget, it says we have 10.75 FTE full-time equivalent. Um, as it stands, we have myself and four other full-time employees. Uh, one of them is a full care, uh, full-time after-school care uh, person. Uh, one of them is our field maintenance crew guy. He does all three of those fields and most of the park by himself. And then the other two are operating my, uh, my programming for the recreation center. Uh, so they're all over the place every day, in and out all the time. So. Uh, uh, one of which does have that license, and utilizing him takes 10 hours out of his week, 
away from what he's trying to do and say he goes on vacation, well, that's 10 hours out of my week that I'm not either here or somewhere else. Um, so essentially we're just trying to, um, sorry, we've got those positions and then all the rest are the part-time positions. Um, and most of them are college students and due to class schedule or whatever else, they're, they're not, there's no consistency there for them to actually obtain the bus license. So again, it's a, it's a challenge. I know uh, Mr. Andrews could probably speak on how many bus problems we had <laughs> over the years. Um, so we're looking potentially uh, with the merging of a few of the non-budgeted or a few of the budgeted positions that are not currently filled and then kind of skimming through our budget a little bit, finding some, some loose change uh, if there is any, and then uh, forming this position as, as a full-time position that I could utilize as kind of a, a jack of all trades. So um, if the money was there, we probably would have tried to do it already, but I just want to make sure that, that you guys are kind of okay with the direction we're looking at doing this. Um, you know, and one of the other things we have is, is I myself, um, you guys do see a lot of these tournaments out here on the weekends, a lot of these events, especially with the, uh, the 75th anniversary coming up, a lot more events like that. I am spending a lot of time out on these fields at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, uh, dragging the fields, lining them with one of my other staff members. Uh, this person would help offset that as well. So, um, you know, I, I would see a decrease in some of our, our part-time help, a decrease in our overtime budget. Uh, and then, you know, we can look at some other stuff that this, you know, if, if we get some certifications maintenance-wise, this person would help as well with that to offset some of that budget. Um, plus, we'd have somebody on site that could fix things quicker than having to make a phone call to, to somebody that we don't have a certification for. So, um, ideally, I'd be looking for somebody with some sort of uh, municipal experience already that we could quickly get a bus license for rather than getting a bus driver and trying to train them on everything else. So, just kind of a unique uh, approach to it. And, you know, just wanted to kind of get the nod from you guys if, if that's what you, you wish and, and go from there. Yeah. That's, uh, your pages are not in my packet, Jay, so I don't have, uh, my packet only goes to 258. Here's our, is it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, this has got 262 on it. I was looking back. But uh, what time does the bus move? We drive the bus in the from afternoon, one o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon. One to three. And then over the summer, we do utilize the bus as well as a couple of our vans. Um, and we have a a seasonal bus driver. And we were going to pull. I was going to pull that funding out of that. And then over the summer, I can spare a few hours, you know, once or twice a week, as as well as the other staff member to help with that. Plus, the smaller vehicles don't require those licensing. So. Well. I the reason I ask that is I was wondering is is that a position that you would want like from noon to eight to help with afternoon uh, things that are going o on over at the rec center and whatnot or yes the, the expectation would be um, our, our number one expectation over there is flexible schedule uh, there are, there is no nine to five there is no ten to eight or whatever um, so this person would be able to help with you know, if we have a, a wedding in the room next door, they could help set that up. Uh, yeah. You know, we have a staff member work it and come in and clean it. So, um, again, it, it's going to take a, a, a rec minded person. Um, but the bus driver position, to be sure to cover that would be number one, and then everything else, you know, would be part of that. So, okay. So he would, he or she would be eight He's to five or as needed. Four positions and collapsing it yeah. into one full time. Is what he's wanting to Yeah, and there, there's going to be a little bit more funding requested for that because those four positions were part time or seasonal. Right. But this would help offset those. They're going to get, the, they'll have Okay, to so basically to. you're going to do it, do most of it simply by a reduction in those part timers. Ideally, it? yes. Yeah. Okay. Probably be easier to keep an, a consistent employee if it was a full time position. Yeah, especially with benefits. Right. And anybody with a bus license is probably working for Pinellas County. They're real easy to find in the summer because they're all off. Right. right. So we have, for summer camp, we've been able to hire, heck, we had eight people on a, on a list and we could just call whatever we wanted. During the school year, though, they're all working. So there's no way to get, a, get in touch with them. So that's the only reason they get their CDL and their bus license anyway. So um, I, I think that's a really a really smart way to go about it and hire somebody that that's their responsibility, but that can do other jobs 
makes it a lot easier and you have a more loyal employee. Sure. You won't have well, to keep going sure. through these. Yeah. That might be a much more desirable job for a bus driver for, that's working for Pinellas County or something to to be driving basically from the middle school over to here rather than all over town every day. <laughs> yes. That's, that would be my thought anyhow. And, you know, my, my uh, schedule's open from one to three if that's what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it takes a lot. There's, they're a rowdy bunch. Yeah, that sounds okay to me, Jay. Yeah. yeah, sounds fine to me. Okay. I'm good. All right, thank you. Okay. Is there any public comment on this? Any electronic comments? Okay. Next is request for additional sanitation position, Mr. A. Arns. I know. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, first, I just want to start out and just give more praise to the Sanitation Department for their response for the storm. They've been um, working tremendously hard. Uh, just a quick update. They, over the past two days, they've taken six full loads um, to the dump. So that's uh, approximately 60 tons the past two days uh, each. So, um, you know, they're working hard. They're trying as best they can to get all the trash removed before Thanksgiving. So just a quick update and, you know, just want to make sure everybody, you know, appreciates how hard they're working and they're doing an excellent job. Um, also, I'd like to all thank the stormwater staff because I know a lot of times sanitation gets a lot of the praise because they're seeing it by door to door all the time. But um, our stormwater guys and girls are, you know, tremendous too. They're doing a great job cleaning up the debris on the beach and um, just wanted to give them a a big thank you for me personally. So, uh, now with the sanitation position, um, you know, we initially started to uh, think about the idea of hiring a full time and the benefits of that would it would be um, it would create more flexibility for our current staff. Right now, we have to rely on one temp, um, a temp service to provide a full staffing. And if we were able to bring on a full-time city employee, we could um, only reach out to them if we had some scheduled annual leave or unexpected sick time. And, um, you know, there's still the possibility that we wouldn't even need to do that, but it would be nice to have a last resort to keep some money available for that. Um, on top of, you know, flexibility, it also gives us uh, the ability to allow the sanitation to have more days off. Um, because these guys are working, you know, a lot of consecutive days in a row, and um, I hate, you know, to have them overworked. And as uh, Mr. Preston mentioned, uh, they do lift some heavy trash cans, and if you're overworked, you know, that's just asking for additional potential for injury. So um, an eighth full-time sanitation staff member would reduce uh, the overworked current staff. Um, you know, budget-wise, we feel that it would be essentially a net, a net zero change in the current budget that we have. We'll just be shifting the money that's currently in our temp services and bringing it to the full-time staff position. Um, depending on a higher date, you know, we can, it, it basically will fit in what we have currently budgeted. So, um, you know, just looking to see what you guys thoughts on and see if it's worth exploring that option. So if you guys have any other questions. I do. That, that was going to be my first question is we just went through budget and if you were talking about adding another person, was this budgeted for? So initially I had requested the additional staff uh, back in March um, through the transition between the finance directors in the middle of the budget process that got lost in that transition. So um, it was something that it, you know, we, we had been thinking about prior to, so it's just one of the things that kind of uh, got slipped in transition from the prior finance to the current finance director. But to answer your question, yes, it's within our current budget. With, it'll just be changing from one light item to another. Okay. And, and the other is I, I uh, don't want to be a stick in the mud. 
I do want to be, I, and I know these guys are just <clears throat> busting, and ladies, I, I know they're busting their tails out there, working hard, and they've done a great job on getting the city back in shape. Um, but I also know there have been times um, over the years that I see a lot of folks parked on a back street, sitting in their truck um, for a while on their cell phones. So I want to be sure they're being properly supervised and that they're when they're at work, they're at work, not uh, not on the back streets, not not doing what they need to be doing. Um, but if but if this employee is in the budget and and you need him, then you need him. But I I, I hate to see our personnel numbers just continuing to grow. Uh, um, as for the garbage cans, I know it's against ordinance. Uh, these cans are supposed to be 32 gallons. I know of a few people that have been cited. You need to make, you know, we need to, to get on a program to educate people. People don't know. I mean, I mean until a neighbor of mine was cited for having a 48-gallon can, I didn't even know it was an ordinance. So unless we educate the public that they can't have a can over 32 gallons, you know, they go head to Home Depot and like, shoot, this bigger one's five bucks more than the smaller one. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of shame on us for not educating people to that. Um, and and what they were doing when when they were empty continued to empty the 48 gallon one was that they were opening it up and they were taking bags out by hand to lighten the load up there so that they weren't lifting a 75 gallon can so mm -hmm. we we need to you know if you need to get some stickers made up or something put the sticker on their can and say hey you know, like a red tag or something, you need to get us a smaller can because this can is just too darn heavy to lift. That's something we might want to think about doing so we don't get somebody hurt. We, um, When we do notice violations, we do give them a red tag and just inform them of it. Um, once we get the same resident tagged multiple times, then we uh, send it over to code enforcement. And then um, as public works, that's about as far as we can go with our, we don't have the ability to find them ourselves, but we do notify them when we see it. Um, and on the public work sanitation page, it does list the can size requirements on there. So we, we, we can put out more bulletins yeah. to show some of the information out there though, but. Yeah, because like I say, I've been here 35 years and I didn't know it until six months ago. So. Maybe we need to, um, add something to our website, like four new residents, you know, don't build anything without coming to it. You know, because people go, oh, I didn't know I needed a permit, because they're coming from other areas where you don't need a permit yep. to put a roofed structure in your backyard. I mean, because we, we, this keeps coming up, that people aren't informed of things, you know, let them know that there's a $250 littering fine. I mean, just, just Maybe that's not so much for residents, but I'd like to see a, a page or a tab just to alert people of, like, the basics of living here because it is different than a lot of places. <laughs> I didn't big. know about the garbage 32 no, I gallon. Not. I think no. mine are bigger than that, no, unfortunately. Right. But, but I, so. think, I think you're, you're spot on when somebody comes to get their parking pass as a new resident. Hand them, a, hand them a piece of paper saying, hey, here, here, are, the, here are the basics. Um, as far as, you know, with this, Jamie, I'm, I'm totally okay. If you want to move money around, that's totally that's your budget. I'm yeah. fine with that. I, I do want to bring something up, and, and, and Mr. Preston brought it up earlier, and it kind of got shoo-shooed away a little bit. But um, I'm not, and I'm not here to beat you up over this. I'm just, I'm relaying... I have been barraged by people who, and it's about sandbags, and it was about no high water sign, high water signs, um, and you know this was a bad storm, and it was unexpected, but it wasn't totally unexpected. We knew about it, 
we had, a, we had enough time to get the little things in place, and I don't think we did that. I, I know that your staff wasn't in on, on Wednesday. I think any time we, we have a storm, and this is, like I said, the learning curve, any time a storm's coming at us, our public works department, whether it's Veterans Day, Arbor Day, or Christmas Day, they need to be out on the streets, man. I mean, because I, I think that was the number one thing I heard from people. The other part was with the sandbags, and I get it, and I'm not telling you, hey, let's sneak around and put more sand on you, but we have sand. So, you know, and I went down there, and there, you know, so if the, the instructions, which came out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, when sun, sunset is at 5.30, so at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the instructions to go to the firehouse get sandbags, then go to John's Pass Park, and by the time you get there, it's dark. I couldn't, you know, I, you know, if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't find it because it had weeds growing out of it. There were no shovels down there. There was no, you know, I, I think we can do better, okay? That, that's all I'm going to say. I, you know, have we spoiled residents in the past? Yeah. Jay will tell you, I mean, we, when we first started getting the rec people out there to go, why do we got to do that? And then for the first time in my managerial career, I said this, because I said so. <laughs> that was it, right? So we went out and we had a blast. It was pouring rain, we were, and, but we did it every time. People actually volunteered to do it. We had residents that would come out there and help shovel. And we'd set it up, you know, so we would, people would drive up, they wouldn't even get out of their car. We'd open up their hatch, we'd load them up. And I know that maybe we can't do that at that level anymore, but you know what? A lot of people felt abandoned by this. And I'm not telling you to yell at you, I'm telling you because I got crushed. I, maybe I got to find a new job because I got way too many people that have way too much access to me. But I mean, I got crushed by a lot of people that were just sitting there going, huh? You know, I mean, I, there were, there were wakes coming in. I mean, I lost, look at my house. I, I got no garage door because of people flying down my street, creating huge wakes. And it, <laughs> I, mean, I got tsunami. I mean, they yeah. went right through my, right, right through my garage, you know, and there were a lot of people saying the same thing. They wouldn't have gotten water in their house if there weren't waves crashing on their door. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I, I was talking to somebody today. That's how they got water damage was people being so inconsiderate as to not slowing down when they're going through the water. The only, the only good part about that is they were riding through salt water, so they'll figure it out in about six months. But... I wouldn't think you need to put no wake signs up on 140th and and on Island Drive and on Flamingo, but apparently we do. There's some low spots and people just plow right through them, and you can see these wakes just going right into houses. Oh, it's amazing! I don't, I well, mean, in my really neighborhood, is. there were no streets. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were just houses surrounded by water, one after the other, after the other, after the other. It was so, terrible on Boca Ciega. Yeah, I mean, there were people now. swimming across the street to their neighbor's house. I mean, it's, it was that bad. Well, I was, oh, my goodness. But I'm just saying that no, you couldn't have put up a sign if you wanted to. Um, no. But anyway, I, I do agree. Go ahead and find our full-time person and get rid of the using a staffing company. Absolutely. Again, I'd rather see a, an employee that maybe makes a career here than using a staffing company. Doesn't sound reliable. <clears throat> so. um, I would like to respond one thing to the sandbags. Um, again, uh, going back to information, getting out, um, I had posted, or the city had posted um, notification of sandbags as a city manager's report back in July to give people an opportunity to prep themselves. Um, because I know people rely on the sandbags. They've grown to rely on them. Um, so, you know, I did want to get the information that we were not able to provide them to the capacity anymore. So I made the city manager's report sh strictly for that, gave them alternatives, gave them, you know, information if they did have sandbags, what to do with them, um, you know, to try and inform the residents at a time. You know, um, and then as the storm was coming into the Gulf, um, you know, we we were getting some calls, and we hand out a handful of bags. They've been, you know, accessible. And the day of the storm, we got we got a lot of calls, but no one was asking for the sandbags. So, I guess I'm just saying, you know, 
I feel like we had prepared everything as much as we could, maybe aside from setting, setting up uh, your own station down there, but at the same time, we were on standby and ready for any resources if people were to ask for them. So, um, you know, I just wanted to make that clear that, you know, due to our prior proactive measures, I didn't feel it was necessary to have the staff in the city throughout the day full time. So. Well, we've always filled sandbags before. I understand. The standard is the standard, right? So if we're not going to adhere to the standard, then that's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. But our residents think we let them down. That was kind of the kind of the gist of what I got. Um, you know, I, I, I just, and I know, you know, that you might have thought that you were going to get some slack for having people on overtime or getting paid time and a half. That's what your overtime's for, for, for storms. I mean, I joke around and say 4th of July is our Super Bowl. Nah, our Super Bowl is storms. You know, we have to, that's when we prove our worth to our, to our citizens that we're there for them. And a lot of people, you know, like I said, you, you might have posted this in July. I'm sure you did. I'm not even questioning that. Nobody's thinking about getting sandbags in July. Um, and, you know, we didn't have any resource. So we basically went from babying them to sending them out, sending, <laughs> sending them down to John's Pass Park with no shovel, no nothing in the dark. And, you know, it, on that day, I just think we can do better. And, and, and that's, I mean, it's a good learning curve for us. We didn't think we were going to get this much water, but we did. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are saying the same thing. If I had sandbags, it wouldn't have been that bad. Well, again, I, I just want to reiter reiterate, we did get a lot of calls during the day. Um, and during that day, we got very few of the calls requesting sandbags. Well, people were used to driving over to the beach and picking them up because we had a crew there filling them. And, you know, we might do good to get the sand up here at Public Works so they can just drive through get the sand and the bags at one place and you got shovels there so hopefully people aren't hauling them off and just we, we just didn't need to streamline it i think for the next time around there will be a next time around so that's all thank you jenny yes sir tom I'm Edwards, protected address. I just want to make a comment about the garbage cans. I was aware of the ordinance, and, but I bought a 45-gallon. And the reason being is that the larger ones have the uh, tops fixed to them. So all they do is flip them open. They pull out the garbage bags and just throw it in the, can, in the truck. I don't expect them to pick up the can. And I usually have two or three of those 14-gallon ones, the little ones that they grab. And they do the same with my neighbors. So you don't have the covers flying around, laying in the street. They're heavier, so they're not blowing down into the street when you have a strong wind. People are at work, and now you got cans rolling around the street. Yeah. So if, if they see where people are violating and, and throwing stuff in there without being in plastic bags or, or expected to pick that up, that's the kind that you should give the warning. But having a larger can that is not causing a nuisance to traffic is good too because I've seen cans rolling around the street as you have and you're trying to drive down and dodge them and, and people are at work so their cans aren't being picked up. So just, just something to consider when you're thinking about that before we start tagging people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any public comments on? Yes or Bob? Mm -hmm. Bob Preston, 425 South Bay Shirt Dog. Uh, Tom's comment on the 45 gallon can, maybe he acts appropriately, but 95% of the people don't act appropriately. That's pretty common around here. Um, and as far as the sandbags, I don't know who's going to look on the city website to see where the sandbags are. As long as I have been here, if there's a storm coming, there's a pile of sand at Archibald Park with two ladders on four sawhorses with cones caught off and shovels and city employees helping the people fill their bags. 
they don't go to look on a website or make a phone call. They just go to Archibald Park because they know for the last, I don't know how many years, I've been here since 2012. You go to Archibald Park and you get your sandbags. And if, they don't, if, if there's so many people there, you fill your own, whatever the case may be. It's no question. You don't look on a website or make a phone call or whatever to find where your sandbags are. And yes, the city let the citizens down on the sandbags. Any other comments? You like no. Comment? Okay, thank you. Before we adjourn, I wanted to mention to you folks um, this past week, you know, we had that, the meeting on the 6th about John's past and the sand issue there, and we had a lot of people in this room from all the way from from uh, the county. Um, Jeff Brandes was here, um, a representative from Charlie Chris's office, a representative from Marco Rubio's office, a representative from Rick Scott's office, a representative from F. Dot uh, DEP. Um, and Army Corps of Engineers and Barry Burton with the county and, and uh, um, Commissioner Long, Janet Long, and uh, Peng Wang, who is the University of South Florida professor that does the studies on currents and uh, sand movement and all that. Um, and it was a lot of good discussion. We didn't get the movement we thought we would, but um, the Secretary of Transportation for Florida or, or this area um, committed some money for a study. Mr. Mr. Uh, Wang, Professor Wang, will be doing a study to find out the exact causes. I think, you know, I've been here 35 years. I kind of look out there and think I know what the causes are, but we got to do another study. Um, but FDOT committed to paying for part of that study. Um, this past, I think it was Tuesday, my days are all running together. Um, I went to the county commission meeting and talked to them and I talked to Barry Burton before the meeting because we didn't get a commitment from them on, the, on November 6th. Uh, but the county has also agreed to pay for part of the study. Uh, I think the private landowner is going to chip in, and the city will probably need to chip in a little bit on that. The whole study is thirty to thirty five thousand so uh, we may be asking you guys for a little bit to chip in on that with the other participants um, it's a six month study, and we were told if we could go ahead and get that study run. Uh, that one of the uh, legislators that were here, legislators that were here, would go ahead and get it in front of the Florida state legislature and, and try to get it onto the governor's desk as far as the groins and whatnot goes. So, um, and, and whatever else we may need to do, I, I think we need jetties, but they're saying that uh, the cost-benefit ratio is not there to do jetties, but when you look at that northern shoal, you can see sand being put into suspension with a wave action that's just coming right in the past. But uh, we'll see what the study finds. But anyhow, I want to just fill you all in before we adjourn on what had transpired on that. Excellent work. Yeah. Mayor, Mayor, before you adjourn, I need to ask, um, I had sent an email to the commission advising the commission that the attorney that is handling the matter of Madeira Beach versus Skyway Properties LLC has requested an out-of-the-sunshine meeting under Florida Statute 286.011. I have to, in an open meeting, ask for or request that. So I'm asking for that shade meeting. We don't have to set it tonight, obviously, but what we can, if I get your permission, your authority will coordinate a time to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. We yes. expect it'll take approximately an hour for that discussion. We do have a settlement offer and we do need to discuss that settlement offer with you. 
Okay. Yes, Fair that's enough. fine with me. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. With that, it is uh, 8.18. This meeting is adjourned.